Um, so we're here to discuss the future of meat. That's obviously a very uh, broad subject. I'm going to be tailoring some questions to our speakers here. And then uh, we're going to open it up for Q&A. So please, uh, as we're going along, uh, keep any questions you may have in mind for the last 10 or 15 minutes of the conversation. And we'll have Jackie Lianza, who was here this morning uh, doing the microphone thing in the aisles. Um, and let me introduce you here to our panelists. Uh, to my immediate left is Tony Baker, uh, founder of Baker's Bacon, who many of you got to know, I think, today. Um, <laughs> and then all the way from Australia, we have Will Barton. Am I pronouncing this right, Will? Gudungay? Gudungay? Gondagai. Should have checked that with you first. My sincere apologies. Founder of Gondagai, all the way from Australia. Uh, Neil uh, Doherty, who is the Senior Director of Global Culinary Strategy for Cisco. And Nathan Bennett, who is the President of West Coast Prime Meats. Uh, so I thought I'd, I'd pick up with a thread, uh, since you know we have a lot of chefs here, we have a lot of purveyors here. Um, you know, we heard a lot in the two panels that happened uh, here this morning. Uh, there was some conversation about the chef uh, purveyor or chef vendor relationship. Uh, some people were asking in the Dry Age Fish presentation about, uh, you know, if, if they ever do uh, customization or certain things for certain uh, clients. Uh, and then uh, the chefs in the plating demonstration were talking with Jamie Simpson from the Chef's Garden and talking about how uh, the Chef's Garden very often will do custom, actually grow things to custom specs, uh, uh, cut them or trim them to custom specs. Obviously, a lot of what you all do is done on a large scale. There's not room for that sort of um, bespoke uh, customer service. But I am curious to know, in the digital age, um, how are you finding the relationship between your, your companies and the chefs you deal with? Has that been diminished at all by technology and the, the amount of, you know, if you go back 20, 30 years, everything was a phone call. There were a lot of personal relationships. We just came out of a pandemic. There's, we're just getting back to the kind of in-person visits people can do. Where would you put the state of, I mean, even it, just in terms of feedback coming in from customers and education and information going out from you all to them. Uh, where would you put the state of the dialogue today and how could it be better in your opinion? Um, and if we could, Neil, you look eager. Am I on? Yeah, sure. So, uh, unfortunately, I remember 30 years ago. Uh, I think the uh, vendor relationship with the customer is crucial. I think uh, where we're going with... Uh, the digital world, et cetera, uh, even the AI with the recipe development, et cetera. I, I, it, it's, it's nice, it's a, good, it's a good crutch out there, but honestly, uh, I built my career in the States on relationships I had with my vendors, whether it was a seafood vendor, beef, what, you know, whatever. I always built the relationship there, and it was crucial to me because in the kitchen, you've got your blinders on. You're really worried about your kitchen and getting the getting dinner out, etc. Right? So you're not really got an awful lot of time. We didn't have time to kind of do an awful lot of recipe development or to really have your pulse on what's happening in your neighborhood, right? Whereas a uh, a a the the service individual or the consultant that comes in to talk to you and to sell to you brings a wealth of information on the backside because you're always going to say, so what's Jimmy doing down the road? And, you know, what's Sarah got going down there? I heard she's doing some wicked cool stuff. And what is that item they're buying? So you get that kind of new generalization where you learn about items that you wouldn't necessarily address on your daily day if you don't have that relationship because technically if you all, we all go to Amazon, right? We all uh, order stuff on Amazon. We put it in the basket and then we... Uh, go to book out and then we go, ooh, I don't need that, I don't need this, I don't need that, right? Uh, and I think we've, uh, you've seen, I, I've seen where people are doing the same order principle on the digital platform for food and then consequently running out midweek or not having something on a Saturday night 
and they have nobody really to call directly to say, hey, can you grab that, stick it in the back of the car and bring it over? Because of, they've made a relationship more with the computer than they've actually made with the person servicing them. It's like the restaurants that don't have phone lines anymore, right? So if exactly. you're running late, you, there's no way for you to tell them yeah, exactly. right, that you're stuck yeah. behind a, an accident on the highway, right? Literally, um, unless you know them. <laughs> okay. Um, Nathan? Yeah, I, I think I can add. Sing on. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, hopefully, at least in our case, we're, we're, we're a little smaller, but hopefully our reps are educated enough where they can add value to the chef. We want them to be out there. And I guess it's evolving from our side because on the one hand, we want to take orders via like an online platform and streamline some of the inbound data and some of the easy questions that our customer service desk can handle. Um, but in lieu and kind of in contrast, we really want um, our sales rep in the restaurant as frequent as possible um, so to introduce new brands like some of the brands up here. Um, but to also they, they should be meet experts and they should be able to sit with you when you're developing a menu or, or rolling out an LTO or something. They should be able to explain to you, hey, try this product or what about this cut or you're looking for value. I can do this. But that, that still, I, I, I think that's really hard to do digitally. I think that has to be in 100% has to be in person. And, and we push for it all the time. So, Tony, you, um, as I understand the origin story of Baker's Bacon, you started it because you couldn't find the bacon that you sought as a chef. Is that yeah, accurate? I mean, um, well, I, I met my business partner, Steve Sachs, at CIA, and after shit-talking American bacon as being oversmoked and too salty and full of uh, water, uh, he invited me up to the to the smokehouse to play. But, um, yeah, we used to be a customer of one of the bigger brands, uh, higher-end bacons in, in the U.S., and uh, I wasn't overly happy with it. And so this was an opportunity to get into uh, the smokehouse and, and, and learn more about more about bacon and uh, an experiment with uh, something that we used a lot of, and it's been a been a wonderful journey. Is there any lesson from the way, what the path you took? In other words, I mean, you there was a product you sought. Uh, it was something that was unavailable. Was there an attempt for you to get somebody to change the way they did things? Did you ever convey your dissatisfaction with people? You know, is there a sliding doors version of that story where you're not doing what you do now because somebody? listen to you and maybe other people and were able to pivot? Well, when we started, we actually, uh, my goal was to make, bring back bacon to America, like proper English back bacon. And we have a product called Long Back, which is the loin that's attached to the entire belly. And Chef Todd here used to use the heck out of it. But, uh, uh, and that's one item that, that I thought we could, you know, get some traction and, and get going. But the reality is you have to process a pig a different way. So, you know, talking about manufacturers and processors that are doing large volumes of stuff, getting somebody to cut something a completely different way than the rest of the U.S. uses turned out to be quite a challenging thing and made it cost prohibitive. And, and we ended up uh, having to to compromise and come up with a different cut. But um, it's a shame because it was a fantastic product. Right. Thank you for that. Will, can we talk a little bit about your company? Um, um, I have to admit, as, a, as someone who's never worked in your industry, I spent quite a bit of time on your website reading about your lamb grading scale and, and, and all of that. I, I can't convey it myself um, without just reading it from your site. <laughs> so before we get into the weeds on it, could you just tell people a little bit about um, the what you all are doing and how what the point of distinction is sure i mean at, at its simplest we are using really advanced technology that we've developed with partners to grade lambs into sort of good better and best if you like and a bit like tony it started from a, a perceived need so our, our family's been in in meat processing forever my grandfather was a butcher he started in 1919 in the little town that is gundy guy uh, Gundagai, for those of you who are trying to pronounce it, uh, and and he owned a butcher shop, like built his way up, and then my, and my father and my uncle started a, a meat packer, as you would call them, here. And I came back to the business after a period away. I was never coming back to it, and then somehow got sucked into the vortex that was the family business about ten years ago. And I used to get calls all the time from from farmers who would say to us, "You know, we make the, we've got the best lamb. Nobody recognises that it's the best." Uh, we're going to start our own brand. We're going to build a little slaughterhouse. And I would say, oh, my goodness, that's like the worst thing you could do. That, that's really hard. This is a scale business. And we're a very small scale in the scheme of things. But I got to, we got to a point in about 2020 because we were what's called a fee-for-service processor. So we took other people's livestock, 
processed them for a fee and then gave them back to them in a box, basically. And I got sick of fielding these calls from people that thought they could do better themselves, knowing that they didn't have the scale to do better themselves. So we created some unique grading um, kind of tech, which I can go into for anyone that's nerdy enough to listen. Uh, and we pay farmers premiums for high quality because I thought if we're going to pull together farmers and we've got over 200 of them that supply us, we need to be able to objectively measure when the lambs are better because otherwise we're going to upset them if we start preferencing things that look better or you know, have, have some appearance of being higher in quality. So we've developed some really cool tech over, over a period of years that, n that doesn't really exist anywhere else in the world for lamb, but not dissimilar to what happens in beef. So we measure overall lean meat yield, we measure marbling, and we measure animal health across every single carcass that we process. Yeah. Thank you. And how does all that, I mean, what's the correlation between the factors you just named and flavor? Um, that's something that's always interesting to me whenever I talk to people who deal in, you know, meat production. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's all these, there are all these measures, right? Yep. But on the customer side, it's about how does it eat? So we, we're very lucky as an industry in Australia. We have a, 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 an industry body called Meat and Livestock Australia who has done over 120,000 consumer taste tests in the US, in Australia, in the Middle East, in, in the EU. And that, and that has given us great insights into what's important for measuring good eating quality experiences. And, and that journey started 20 or 30 years ago. Um, and the limitation in lamb has been that we process it very quickly. So it's small. We process about eight lambs a minute. And we don't have a cut surface like you do in beef to actually assess marbling and compare it and what have you. So you have to have tech that can keep up. And the evolution of machine learning and uh, sensors in processing has been so fast in the last sort of three or four years that that's enabled this kind of, this kind of tech. So marbling is the key and, and it's varied. So there's some lambs that have got good marbling, some that have bad. It's not necessarily directly aligned with breed or feed. It's about matching genetic potential with nutrition and like I said, I'm a huge nerd for it, so I'll stop. But it, but it's, it, all of those factors come together. The, the other trick is that if you ask a farmer to produce something with a high level of marbling, one of the easiest shortcuts, if you don't have the right genetics, is just to over-fatten it. So fatten it and fatten it and fatten it until they deliver something that's got a huge amount of outside fat, which upsets us as a processor because we're paying for, for yield that we can't get and invariably then upsets a the chef because they have to trim a lot of it off. And you don't survive very long in that in that space. If you push the other way and go for very lean, you often end up with a, an eye muscle that has got no marbling in it and it doesn't taste very good. So this allows us to do something really consistently uh, day in, day out. Yep. Right. Thank you for that. And I'm just, you know, you mentioned that this, you, this is something that's exclusive to your company at the moment. Is it something that's going to remain proprietary or is this something that you hope will have a ripple effect throughout your industry? No, I hope it'll have a ripple effect. It's it's not something that's uh, we have any ownership in as a family business, so it's a still a hundred percent family business. And I'm pushing the Australian industry just to jump straight into this because if you come to a market like like the US, which is a really big market for Australian lamb, and you have variability in your product quality, but you're calling it out in your marketing as all being fantastic, and then you give it to a chef and you have varied outcomes with it. And you think, well, I'm doing the same thing in my kitchen. I'm preparing it the same way. I'm executing it the same way. But I've got varied outcomes in in my in my restaurant. Then ultimately, the US will just say, we've tried lamb. It's a bit hit and miss. So as an industry, we need to be doing it much more consistently, um, so that when you buy our product, it hits every time. You don't get a miss, and you say, I just need more of that product because it's always a winner for us. And and that's really what we set out to do with with the brand. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, Tony, I'd love to talk, this is very specific, but it, it came up in the, com the email conversations back and forth that I was having, um, and when it came up here, when we were all just talking, it seemed like you're not the only person uh, with an opinion on it. Um, but there are two, um, I don't know, I guess measures on the table. Uh, one is Prop 12, which is in California. And the other is referred to by the abbreviation Q3, which does not mean third quarter. Um, can you just, and they're interrelated, and as I understand it, Prop 12 is now on hold until the Q3 question gets resolved. Is that accurate? I don't think so. I think 
sorry, I think Q3 is still, there's some, some legal stuff still happening with the Q3, mostly pertaining to transshipment of product through the state. Okay. Uh, which um, I'm going to guess is going to get resolved because it's such a huge piece. Um, it's really impractical if they don't allow transshipment. Um, so we'll, we'll have to see about that. But can you uh, just, just in layman's terms, can yeah, you just explain so to the, what these two, Prop 12 uh, what is, these two is, things are? It's specific. It's a humane, humane uh, thing. It was uh, pushed to the California voters in, in 2018. Uh, Sixty-five percent of the voting, voting went pro Prop 12. And what it means is, is it's uh, part of the, the breeding programs of pigs. So it's this pertaining specifically to the sow barns, um, and they, they need six extra feet of room in the gestation crates. So uh, basically, it's a ban on gestation crates, changing them to a gestation pen, which means for the four months that a pig is pregnant, it allows that, that mother to, to turn around and scratch its own butt or move around and just have a better quality of life. Um, why is that important? Because gestation crates, if they trap the mother for that entire period, meaning that it can't move forward, backward, sideways, they'll generally get about one extra piglet per gestation cycle. So if you could get an extra 10% in revenue in your business, would you do it? Um, gestation crates are actually banned in 10 U.S. states, including Florida and Ohio. Ohio produces about 8% of the uh, United States pork production. And... Um, and they don't use gestation crates. So it's not that unreasonable. Um, EU has banned uh, gestation crates uh, for, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. I think it was uh, 1999 that the UK banned gestation crates. So um, it's a topic that's been on the radar for the whole industry for a very long time. Um, and the only challenging thing here in the US is that a single state can dictate to the rest of the industry what they want, which um, has been very controversial and very, very difficult in implementation. Uh, I know Nathan from West Coast Prime, he obviously sells a lot of pork, and what it's meant is that we all have to, if, if you're selling product in and out of the state, as we all do, um, you have to basically, it just doubled all of your SKUs. Um, it created a tremendous amount of volatility in the market, uh, a lot of increased costs, and uh, a lot of a lot more questions and answers when you look at the CDFA website. So um, it's a very difficult difficult thing to uh, to manage and implement. And uh, uh, we're all scratching our heads still a little bit. Uh, come January first, that's when we're all going to be held to account on Prop 12, and that they'll start issuing consequences for people not following the rules. But uh, it's it's been an interesting year. And what's the you know. Something I hear all the time uh, from from restaurateurs, and we heard a lot about a lot from people in 2020, right? When when people were talking about the the quote unquote reset um, and how out of whack restaurant prices are with what it actually costs to operate a restaurant and how slim the margins are, um, you know, where the where the rubber meets the road, you know, what does this mean? What does this mean in terms of cost? What is what is uh, wow? That's <laughs> that says it all. I mean, but I mean, it, it seems it's, it's going to be a lot more. I mean, we literally. I mean, I was embarrassed a couple months ago on what we were having to charge for our product between Prop 12 and the increased commodity market pricing in pork, which all of our prices are based off of. Um, our product was literally double uh, in terms of. Um, uh, our cost to produce it, and then what we had to set up for, uh, which is just unbelievable. And I felt sorry for chefs and restaurants. I mean, what if you're a breakfast restaurant? I mean, it impacted eggs. Prop 12 is not just pork. It's impacting eggs, impacting veal. Um, and so egg prices have gone through the roof. Pork prices has gone through the roof. Um, there is, it, it has created some innovation in the space. Uh, Prop 12, there's a weird thing with Prop 12. It doesn't impact ground pork, which means sausage, meatballs, that kind of thing. Um, doesn't impact fully cooked so ham, um, you'll see in California, you go to a grocery store, you're going to see roasted bacon, which means bacon that's met a lethality step and also has received 60% shrink. In order to call bacon fully cooked, you have to lose 60% of its weight. Uh, we've, we run into that issue with our sous vide bacon because it is fully cooked. Uh, we take it to 160 degrees for an extended period of time, and, uh, and yet we can't call it fully cooked because we haven't lost 60% of its weight, and that's one of the USDA definitions. So there's a lot of weird ex exceptions in this, in, this, in this proposition that make it very difficult to navigate. Thank you. Uh, restaurant chefs themselves, I mean, uh, you know, I 
don't envy you. I'm out of the restaurant business now uh, as of 2020, and food cost was always an issue back then, and it's even more so now. Uh, and labor costs as well is a huge issue. So running a restaurant these days is uh, a difficult thing. Well, the other thing, and, and maybe you all could respond from your end of things, but something, you know, you just mentioned the kind of end runs people can do, right? And I hear this all the time from people who run, um, I don't know, let's call them quality restaurants broadly, right? And what I, what I hear them say all the time is that customers say to them, how come a steak in your restaurant is this much? and the restaurant down the street, it's this much, right? Because your average citizen has no idea about the differences from brand to brand, the differences um, uh, um, in, in, in the pricing that, that, uh, that results from that. They, um, they just don't know. They don't follow, you know, and they don't know that certain restaurants and chefs are very committed to a certain quality of product, and other ones are committed to the bottom line, right? Um, so I would, I, this to me, what you're describing would, um, would be an advantage uh, for the bottom line people, right? If they, if they figure it out, they're less devoted to certain cuts, they're less devoted to certain dishes, they can, they can rejigger their whole menu, uh, right, to um, put themselves at a competitive advantage. Is that accurate? Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, um, you're right about pricing. I mean, you got one restaurant using Select and another person using, you know, Prime. I mean, what's the difference there, Nate? I mean, it's, it's significant. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, apples are not, <laughs> it's apples and oranges. And it depends on, the, on how, what the spec is as well and what the attributes are. But yeah, I mean, it, there's, there's a huge spectrum. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm just trying to think, you go through a yield on like a New York, for example. Let's say a center cut New York yields 50%. Well, if your raw material on one is $10 and the other one's $20 and you divide that by 50%, you have a $20 center cut New York versus a, a whatever, a $40 New York. So it can be really drastic um, just on a specific cut with a low yield. For That's a, one example. Neil? Our, problem, our problem is that we're spoilt. I mean, if a lot of us, I mean, we grew up, we ate a lot of stews and items like that. A steak was a big deal growing up, you know. But now we're so used to eating the style that we have. We have so many different styles of food. But if you really look at Europe or you look at uh, Asia or anywhere else in the world, a, a steak in the UK is six ounces. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know it's, it's not helping the meat sales, but, but I'm saying it's the, the fact that meat is a part of the meal, it's not all of the meal. So you go to a steakhouse here in the States, and uh, the, the steak fills technically half the plate, and then we've got a 60-count uh, baked potato, which is more carburate, carbohydrates than we should be eating. Um, so we're, we're used to eating how we want and as much as we want, because we're one of the richest countries in the world. So it's not a problem, and our prices have been cheap for a long, long time. Uh, I don't know if you guys realize, we're probably at a, well, an inflationary number somewhere around 36% when you take in every variable. But if you think about some of the chains for your hamburgers, uh, there's a chain out there, and I can't, I'm not gonna say its name, obviously, but uh, they make fresh French fries. And uh, I'm a fan of them, and uh, you know, anybody in the cooking industry, we're the world's worst eaters when we're between shifts or going somewhere. And so I used to always stop there at least twice a week, and uh, I could get the burger, the fries, and a soda uh, pre-pandemic for about $14. Uh, I was there two nights ago, and that same exact meal hasn't changed, their spec, which they're totally on consistency, is now $22. So that is a major jump, but we're seeing it everywhere. Food trucks at a, at a sports bar, they're getting $12 for the uh, burger and they're getting 5 to $6 for the fries. So we're seeing it out there all the time. It's because we haven't been able to change our portioning. I mean, if you really think about it, when McDonald's started off in its heyday, what was that? It was a quarter pounder, right? Which before cook cooking, before cooking, <laughs> two point eight when it was cooked, right? And you had a, you know, you could get the double, which we all thought was more meat than a man can handle or a woman. And then you went to a triple, and then there was there's places that you could actually get four of them. Now you can eat four of them, no no problem. But uh, we expect an eight ounce burger, or we expect at minimum a five point three ounce burger, right? Or fully dressed 
with the bond, which the bond is now on average 10 cents more than it was. So if you're an, an operator, I mean, I deal with a lot of, uh, I do a lot of consulting, and we have chains, massive chains, that used to net net at the end of the day 7% and are now down to 6%. Their only saving grace is that because they're a chain that they can purchase their own real estate. Now, as an independent or a small emerging chain, with the, with the prime cost, the cost of labor, the cost of raw goods, which is what we all sell, and everything else, it's a shrinking margin there. So unless we really look at portion control, I mean, you know, there's a you know, massive plant forward out there and everything else, and, you know, a lot of anti-beef and, and uh, animal uh, proteins, but at the end of the day, no matter how hard we do to produce, we're not going to be able to feed everybody at the size we're feeding them. So if we'd fell back into more what Europe and the Middle East, Asia, everywhere else, uh, the meat is a part of the, of the component. I think when we were uh, back in the day, I mean, did you do London City Guilds? Oh, yeah. Right. So back in the day, it was one third, but one third was a max on a plate for your portioning. One third of the weight of the plate was the meat. And now we're at where the meat, I mean, I mean, I've set down to 12 ounce, 14 ounce steak, no problem, but that is an awful lot of product. And as you said, at, at a 50% yield, I mean, you're taking up a massive amount. So I think we just need to educate people on how to, to portion better. And for our customers really to understand that eating that way is the way to go. The, your comment about inflation and margins really resonates with me. It's, you hear the same stuff from restaurants. Um, you know, restaurant pricing has not increased at the same rate that inflation has, right? And I, I believe, and people have told me this, it's anecdotal, but that it is because of uh, resistance by the customers, right? And it seems to me, um, and it sounds maybe... Um, I mean, this has to be reflected in, the, in how you all price what you do, I would imagine. But it's, you know, the, the, the industry has kind of built a monster for itself for understandable reasons. But, you know, the margins do keep getting smaller. And I feel like there's probably a rip the Band-Aid off moment coming um, for pricing in restaurants. Uh, or there should be. Um, but the only problem with that is we've spent so many years, if you think about food in the early 80s in the U.S. and the amount of people that would eat out, it was minimal in comparison to what we eat out now. I know in, in Houston and Texas uh, in the 80s, the average family, uh, the average person would eat out four to four and a half times. And at present, it's at 11 so, and that's including the Starbucks in the morning, et cetera, right? You're talking about weekly? Weekly. This is weekly. Uh, these were numbers that we were working off in Texas. And with inflation, the fact that talking about the pricing has to come up. But the problem with pricing coming up on all of us is when pricing comes up, then we make decisions to eat a little bit more at home or to make other choices. So, you know, the old grab and go. I mean, supermarkets have really embraced it with their meal kits and all these items. So it makes it a little easier for us. But you combine the average price of everything going up, the fact that a restaurant needs to put the price up, and then there's forced tipping in a lot of, uh, a lot of areas that you never had forced tipping in. So what we're doing is we're, we're telling the average person eating out, me or you or any family member, that they're really looking at that at the end of the day, and they might cut out one meal a week eating out, or in a lot of cases, maybe two. I mean, because if you look at their mortgage rates and everything else, there's, there's a time for tightening the belt. So, and we really don't want that to go through our industry, do we? I mean, we, like you said, we just got back in the game. So do we really want to slow it down again by overpricing? I think the biggest thing in pricing, and the guys jump in here, is logistics. It's just getting the stuff shipped around the country or to anywhere on TB, even to be able to make appointment times is, is, is hell right now. Well, I think, I think the logistics part, that's, that's definitely part of it. Also, your, 
your packaging costs have almost doubled, and, and those kind of correlate with the price of oil. I mean, it's plastic, right, that goes around a lot of these cryovac bags. Um, but going back to your point on the portion size, I think something at least we're seeing trend-wise, and I know San Diego's on the front of the culinary scene. We're seeing it more here. And, and you guys have traveled internationally a fair amount or live internationally. The portion sizes are a big deal, but um, seeing more share plates, like for example, I can't eat a 14 ounce steak anymore. And if I go out to dinner with friends or family, we'll typically order, there's four of us, but we might only order two steaks and share them and have the kitchen slice them for us. So we just get, I want to try a little bit of this and try a little bit of that. And I also hope, and I'm seeing more of, um, and I guess this is more European model, is the full animal utilization. And I think that's a really important part too. Um, we're getting more and more requests for um, cuts like, I mean, think about it. 10 years ago, did anybody ask for a picanha or even know what that was? I mean, and so you're starting to get things like that um, that, are, that are becoming a little more common. And so it's, I guess it's good. And that's, I think that innovation is kind of, I guess, offsetting some of that pricing a little bit. So I, I think we'll see it's, more and more of that. It seems like we're running out of those secondary cuts. Up. <laughs> I don't know. We invent one or reinvent one like every year. The tourist page so. of it's only well, yeah, two of them I on mean, an animal and they came out at $5 a pound and 10 yeah. now. You know, skirt steak, look at that. I mean, that's, that's ridiculous. I mean, you pay more for skirt steak than filet mignon these days sometimes, you know, yeah. or, um, you know, we used to use veal cheeks. They used to pay 90 cents a pound for them, you know, and they're now... We can't get rid of them. Teens, yeah, yeah, they're know? giving them away, yeah. 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 Secondary steaks. So it's the same with, like, if you think about it, when we're be talking about seafood, but bycatch. Now it's an entire market. So you're going out there to literally catch bycatch instead of going after your primary. So it's the same thing in, our, in the meat industry. I mean, because we have Buckhead Beef and uh, Newport, it's the same thing. We want to be able to cut better cuts for you and, and do lesser expensive cuts. But it's, it's the, the labor part, the packaging, like you said, the boxing, the USDA, and everything else that's involved in it, your, start, your starting cost before you even put the knife to the plate is, is expensive. So what about, what about um, regulation? Uh, you know, you all are experts in your field. I, I hear, I hear uh, when I've been able to interview, uh, you know, people who uh, raise, uh, package, sell meat, um, most people I know have a feeling that it's... it's um, how do I put this? They feel like for themselves it's probably overregulated, but they feel like they but they understand the reasons for it um, because someone will take advantage if um, if it isn't right. Um, I'm just wondering how do where do you all see this? You know, like we're talking about Prop 12 and Q3, and uh, do you guys do you all feel like you're more encumbered than uh, maybe you were in the past? Do you feel like it's moving in a direction of? Um, uh, of things be, of being more restricted, of not of needing to kind of follow uh, policies that are handed to you versus um, how you may handle it yourself. I'll have a go at this first from a non kind of US point of view, and we have so many rules in Australia. We're like a little bit European in that sense that there's there's a rule for everything, right? We're very ordered and what have you. And I, I think it serves us particularly well in our agricultural. Produce. We produce far more than we could ever consume in Australia. And so it, it serves us really well. One of the spaces that I find really interesting in terms of regulation and standards and what have you is the evolution of regen farming and sustainability and all these sorts of things that we're sort of feeling our way with to a large degree. So if you go back 20 years, you had conventional agriculture over here and then you had organic over here and there wasn't any choice between the two. One was hideously expensive and only for kind of the crazy uncle at Christmas who, who couldn't conform with the rest of us over here in conventional land. And now you've got this really big spread between one and the other. And in Australia, certainly, we're feeling our way into what's really important. And we're doing that by talking to the people that are, that are using our products, so chefs and feedbacks. But there's still a, a really big divide between what people say they want out of a product and what people will pay for. So you get this dynamic where somebody says, this is exactly what I want, and you say, okay, no worries, this is the price, and they say, ooh, I don't want it that much. And so for us, it's, a, it's, it's trying to build things at sort of industrial scale or, or at enough scale to make it work, but still deliver on sort of sustainable practices and all the things that we're aspiring to be, I guess, as a society. So, And the, I'm assuming that the... Um that the right answer to that, that there's like a there's a matrix of factors, you know, like 
like Neil was talking about portion size, maybe that works into the matrix of factors that would help you net out where you need to. Is that accurate? Yeah, I, th I think the other thing is well, I don't think we've I don't think we've really figured out yet as an industry how to convey the information to a consumer at a table in a restaurant because there's this kind of willful ignorance that goes along with a consumer who comes in and they just want to be told they're doing the right thing. They don't actually need to be... It doesn't have to be proven to them, if you like. And, and so then price becomes a major thing, right? You buy on price rather than chasing something. At a, at, and so, like, we're doing a good... I think a good job as a supply chain to, to bring our farmers along and try to tell that story and what have you. But I think it's still a challenge at the, at the restaurant level because not everybody wants to be stopped and explained how Gundagai lamb works and why it's better for the environment. Most people want to come and have a nice meal with whoever they're dining with. Well, so. you're also competing for attention with what the restaurant's trying to te teach people about why we have a service charge now and, like, why we're trying to move away from this, And right? I mean, there's only so much people want to be taught um, when they're sitting down to order, you know, I order dinner. I Port think Portlandia made the best skit of all of it with uh, Colin, remember, the chicken? I've never seen Portland. Oh, I mean, it's the best. But I mean, and they did one on celery. It was it was magnificent. But the the bottom line is there is a, a, a percentage of people that want to be uh, to, to to get a story behind what they're reading and and to know where the the lamb's coming from. Small farm. Uh, I mean, uh, I know that uh, Cape Grim, for instance, with their beef coming from Tasmania. Uh, it has a story behind it. It's 100% uh, grass-fed. It has marbling, which is you never see with a, a beef product out of grass, really, right? But uh, then there's a massive percentage that want, and I mean, and I always say fishing in middle America, because you got, you've got white tablecloth and then you've got QSR, which serve their needs. But in, in, right in the middle, the, that big chunk, which drives 90% of all sales in the U.S., is looking for a happy medium uh, you know we'll talk about choice beef if they're not looking for prime select works in certain areas for like roasting etc so I think that really if you look at it that is where the real look has to be looked at would one of the major defining features of that be value or perceived value that, that large swath that you're talking about? No, not really. I think, I think everybody wants to have a decent, uh, a decent meal, right? I mean, none of us go out there looking for an undecent meal, right? But, uh, for instance, we go out there, and if you're going to have pho, for instance, right? Well, the meat that's been used for that is shaved. It's great meat. But they're not going for that premium marbling and fat. Actually, quite the opposite, to be honest with you, because uh, iRound is uh, one of the big players for it. But they're looking for, you know, you're getting that satiety of eating meat and with, with all the other items, but there's a balanced bowl for you. But when you come to a steak, I think that's where we're very, all of us have a bit, we all want to pay that mid-range price, but expect to get the fine dining experience. So that's where sous vide has really made a big difference, right? Being able to, to cook it and then reverse sear uh, I think that really made a big play where you can actually take a, I wouldn't say value added, I'd say a, a decent cut of meat and, and make it something. So if you think about short ribs, how, how short ribs are just blowing up, they're everywhere now, right? Braised short ribs are on technically everybody's menu in some form or other. And I think that we figured out that we can take an item and we can elevate it, whereas the old culture that we all grew up in was you start off with the top ingredients and you're going to always have a great meal. Well... I honestly think that's malarkey. I think top ingredients for certain plays, but at the end of the day, it's really about how do you fine-tune it. Look at French cuisine. They're not going out there buying the, the top of the line when they do beef for, for a, with, with, you know, you'd get the old uh, palms frites, right? That's a very okay piece of meat, but then they enhance it with more fat for satiety, right? So they're using the garlic butter, the herb butter. So I think they figured out that you can either have your super fine dining or you can have a very acceptable and decently priced meal tier. Great, thank you. Anyone else want to get in on this one? All right. You, you, the question was about uh, legislation and, and all the rules. What concerns me, just, just just bring the Prop 12 thing up one more time, with California, is like, imagine if 
10 more states jumped in and did something similar but different. And as producers, we'd have to carry different SKUs and different rules. I mean, at what point does it become like completely unmanageable? And just, just to explain, because I, I think this is correct, right? It's not just um, meat raised here in California that it would apply to, right? This is what you're saying. This is why you mentioned 10 st other states could be affected. For it to be sold here, for it to be ser so served and sold and served here, it has to be raised to those standards wherever it comes from. That's so it's, yeah. it's putting a strain on pr people all over the country or That's wherever correct. they're yep. growing. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say what he said in terms of like from a distributor perspective or somebody that's portion controlling it, um, you know, I actually agree with Prop 12 and what it's doing. Um, the implementation has been horrible, but um, for us what it means is let's say I have 400 SKUs that are pork SKUs, right? So now I have to have another 400 pork SKUs and that's just pork SKUs that we're buying. So one's Prop 12 and one's not. And then think about let's say I have a uh, pork butt, for example, a commodity pork butt then we have a diced half inch, diced three quarter inch, and then I have a ground, and then I have a sliced, and then I have all of that, and then you throw that. So one master case code actually could be linked to 10 portion codes. So now I've doubled the amount of raw material codes and I have exponentially more other codes. So that's just on one thing. So from a practical standpoint, it's a lot harder to implement these things than I think they foresee, even though we agree it. And I guess that's why we're getting a little window to do it, but it's definitely hard. And, and I was just going to say, just in general, in terms of regulation, I think, I think, um, I mean, California is a hard place to operate, but I think all of us enjoy the benefits of being in California because of the population and the weather and where we live. But um, I think a, a big thing that's missing, at least directionally, uh, with some of the, the portion stuff and some of the holy animal stuff, I also think the labeling and the USDA, the things they're working on there, um, we don't really see those as a is a problem, but I think the USDA could get a lot better on clarifying what what is allowed on labeling and what labeling means. Like, what does natural actual actually mean? You know, or what is or never ever, or what is uncooked or cooked actually mean? And almost to the point where it goes back. To, I almost think they should teach agriculture and like food labeling in schools. I mean, because it's it's just so you have to know so much right now just to be able to even. In, and I'm supposed to be an expert, and I still got to go. Wait, it's this brand. Wait, which bull, you know, which check mark was it? And it's it's very hard for general consumer to be able to do that. It's like parking parking signs in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but most people probably don't realize, but the language that's used on a lot of our food labels is completely dictated by the USDA when it comes to meat. So, the the term uncured, and then the little tiny asterisk that says except for naturally occurring and celery and that type of thing even down to the font size of the certain placements of the, the words uh, are all mandated and dictated in terms of uh, label. So, and they have to go to, each one of our labels has to go through DC and get approved by USDA before it can go to market. So it's pretty, very strict regulations. All right. I'm going to, Jackie, you ready? All right. Jackie Leonza is going to help me out here. Can we see hands from any questions in the audience? Oh, this Anyone? can't be. Okay. Guys. Really? Well, we do have a couple of questions in the app. Oh, well, okay. I think there's some interest on how lab meat or 3D printing or print meat will affect the culinary industry. Neil's chomping Neil. at the bit. I can, I can That's so, totally speak. A whole so to speak. Uh, no, I could jump on it real quick. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I grew up in a farming community, so we, uh, you know rid our own animals, etc. But we uh, we actually have partnered up with uh, Mission Barns on the growth of pork fat uh, that they're doing in a lab environment because it's just used as an ingredient to add satiety to products. Uh, I've, I know somebody had asked about 3D uh, prints and on some of these items. Uh, I think that when we send the first shuttle up to Mars, I think it's going to be fantastic. I think because obviously we're not going to bring the cows, the sheep, and the pigs with us. So we're going to have to figure out ways of growing proteins. Uh, it's, it's a little bit like Orwellian, isn't it? It's, it's like you kind of... If we ever get to a stage where we can't feed the population, then yes, it's great. But th think about the uh, the knee-jerk reaction that everybody has to GMO corn. How many people's against GMO corn out here? Right? Okay. 
So do you know why GMO corn was uh, set up in the first place? GMO corn was set up to be drought resistant and to be resistant to insecticides for the simple thing of being able to feed in Africa. We needed a crop that could work in Africa under really arid conditions and to be able to, to, you know, to feed people. That's what it was all about. And then we figured out here at home that, wow, we're going to get wonderful corn yields, we're going to get this, we're going to get that. And that's how it became a big cash crop. Just like soybean, etc. Just like those beautiful Driscoll strawberries you eat. Who eats? Has anybody ever eaten Driscoll strawberries here? Or giants, right? All those berries. Well, all those berries, they actually splice and dice to make those plants grow for only, they only yield one crop and then they're done. And they have, they have, in a lab environment, that's how they actually build these prototypes. So what we, what we have in our psyche is we all think about corn. Well, do you think we're going to bring that and also put that and put it over the lab-grown meat? Uh, we have uh, plant-based burgers out there right now. Lots of different ones. Hi, Phil, back there, the king of the plant-based. Uh, have you ever looked at the ledger on the side of what's in the ingredients? Versus if you look at a beef that is grown naturally on the land. The uh, beef is actually, I think, two ingredients. They usually have a few ice chips in there when they're grinding to keep it cold. Uh, and the other one has about 68 ingredients. So you've got to really wonder when we when we do all of this to, to say that we're feeding the world, because that's what we said when we did the corn. We're feeding the world. Uh, and that's what we're saying about lab-grown meat, that we're here to feed the earth for when, you know, that we build so many housing estates, there's no farmland left. Uh, really, you've got to look at it and go, are we really feeding, thinking about feeding the earth, or are we letting ourselves get carried away before it's time. Uh, it's, we're in the development phase, but commercialization. And I know for a fact, because we've been involved in the launch of uh, multiple different concepts like this, that a lot of it is based around being able to generate venture capital and to be able to commercialize. But not everything can be commercialized at the rate it needs to be. Could you imagine, especially here in California, how much electricity it will take to run a commercialized plant doing lab-grown meats. It's massive. So we have to ask ourselves that question. Are you willing to pay, and it's, it, it's a super premium on it, it's a great item at the, at the present time to put on a menu to, to gain interest in its evolution, but its evolution really isn't today. Thank you. We have an audience question. Oh, sorry. No, no. no, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, ne this is Phil Waring. Neil and I go back and forth on the whole plant-based thing quite a bit. But uh, if you actually break down the chemical ingredients in beef, you'll have about 74 ingredients. So the FDA makes us list all ingredients in plant-based products. I knew you were going to bring that one up. I know, because it's, it's the truth. But anyway, <clears throat> real quick, let's address the, the ugly thing in the room here. And I'm not talking about Neil. Um, Cargill, JBS, Tyson, Smithfield, Hormel, Conagra, and Marfrig slaughter about 90% of all the animals in the United States. In the past, they've colluded to drive down prices to farmers. Correct? They've been sued and they've been fined. They've created false shortages to drive up prices to operators. And these are the meat companies who are all currently reporting absolutely record profits in, a, in supposedly an inflationary time. And they're record profits and increased margins. So think about that. They're making more profits on higher cost products and raising their prices too, over and above what their normal margins would have been prior. I'm sure I'll get some feedback here. So what's the real answer? 
Should they be broken up? Should they be allowed to have the monopoly on the meat industry like they do? And also, I was going to ask you about cell-based proteins as well. So, but anyway, there's my question. What do you think, guys? Uh, I, 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 I think as a, I think as a small operator like we are, so we have the presence of big companies like the ones you've mentioned in Australia. For a smaller family operation like ours, uh, ours is to be to choose a path where we can value add, where we know that we can tell a story. Um, I, uh, our family can't be the largest, fastest, cheapest processor of meat in Australia. It's just it's not going to happen. So you have to find ways to get around that. But ultimately, it's the consumer who who chooses who is successful. And if that's price, and if those companies can do it the cheapest, then that's a very strong thing to break. So I think it's 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 up to the consumer, in in my mind, certainly in our market in Australia, to to choose to follow the stories that resonate with them. And I think it's also up to chefs to ask the follow-up question to is it sustainable and not just say, is it sustainable? Yes, great. So is it sustainable? Yes, it is. How? Explain it to me. Tell me a bit more. Because the third and the fourth and the five whys is where some of those bigger companies will come completely unstuck because there's not a lot of depth. Uh, and I think it's... It's one of those things that, that we all have a role in in making better informed decisions about where we're getting our, our food from. One other thing. Um, with regards to small farmers, my company, we, we support a lot of small farms across the United States proudly. And, and a lot of them, Neil, do actually produce meats as well. And we like the fact that most of them practice re regenerative proce processes in agriculture. Everybody in this room, remember this. Regenerative agriculture is going to be a big thing for us in the future. It's going to be the, the most important thing in the industry. Um, so what I was going to say was, you know, um, Neil, you were spot on about the fact that we need to eat smaller portions. You're absolutely correct. Because the United States, we've been so used to supersize me, 24-ounce steaks, who can eat the 84-ounce top sirloin at, you know, this place, and... and and making TV shows about it, right? We laud gluttony to a large degree, right? So, Mike, you're absolutely right. So with that, if we shrink the, the amount of meat that we eat on the plate, we should just eat more plants, right? That, because the meat industry in itself is not sustainable. It is not. It is not climate friendly, and it is not sustainable. <laughs> That's a lot. So let me sit and digest. Aren't a you bit glad of that. you poked I, this guy before? I have a couple. Of, I, have a, I have a couple of things too. Yeah, get I in mean, there. Get in there. Yeah. Well, I mean, first, Phil, and, and um, I didn't put him in the, the audience. I promise. Well, I think I think some of it's a little bit of a red herring. I mean, the biggest problem in the USDA is documented. It is food waste. Go right to their website. Thirty percent of the food we produce. And this is, doesn't even hit the. Re I feel like restaurants are even a little better and you and have less food waste. Um, the biggest. I mean, you talk about retail. Think about it when you personally go home and shop every weekend. My wife and I. We go. To, we budget. We go to Costco, pick up some of these things. We go to the store. We go to this store. We go, and then oh, a kid soccer game. This happens. That happens. And oh, we then you get there to Sunday, and you throw. Uh, we didn't use that. That went bad. Or the grocery store itself. Think about how much food they're throwing away. They're there to bring food in, market, market it, make it look nice, um, and then you don't bring it home. So if you if you think about thirty or forty percent of food waste, now let's apply that to the cattle industry, and you think about how many head of cattle or what you could reduce by just reducing food waste. I mean, it's it's exponential. That's the number one problem, and I'm, I'm seeing it from both sides. I mean, I would love to only bring in regenerative products and only bring sustainable products in. There's, there's a customer for it. You have to be willing to pay for it. Um, but, I, I mean, until we really tackle that food waste issue and find solutions around that, I mean, the rest of these things are just rounding errors, in my opinion. Well, we've got, we, we kind of partnered up, and you know about this, Phil, with uh, uh, Do Good Chicken. And what they do is they, they go and they take food waste from uh, restaurants, uh, grocery stores, etc. They actually uh, cook it down to a, yeah, and technically uh, to a temperature where it's t technically pasteurized. 
It's then pureed and dried and made into pellets, and then it's fed to the animals, uh, the chickens, in the last two weeks of their growth. So there, there is people out there trying to look at the food waste aspect and bring it in. But I mean, I know as, as a chef at the, end of the, at the end of the night when we're pulling the bags out to the dumpster, number one, the plastic, which is uh, pretty bad, uh, really bad. And then they're, uh, you know, we, I mean, they're full. They're packed with food that's been scraped off plates. And never mind losing four or five forks and knives in the process. But the bottom line is, it's a massive, and all of you know that. And you put out a buffet, forget about it. You're, you're you know, catering and stuff. The amount of food that's left over at the end. And I think, you know, it, it's really, it's, I think portioning will really help with it because then people will clear the plates and they won't be leaving it over, right? I think the fact that inflation is going to change how we're going to eat, it's definitely going to change how we're going to eat. And I think we'll be forced into it whether we like it or not, into portioning. And I think that we'll respect the food more when it's given a value. Have you ever done an event where it's free to go to and you get 50 people that say they're coming and 25 show up? But if you sell 50 tickets, you're going to get 45 people show up because they're not going to waste their money. So if you think about it from a, from a plating aspect, if the food has a worth that it's like... You're not going to get for that, what was it, two for two dollars or something at one, at one of the chains or three. You, that, that food has no value to you, really. But, I mean, if you're paying for it and you know it's an expense and you're feeling it, you're going to like it better. You're going to take full use of it. But, Phil, I do, I, I'll give you the European standard on this one, not the UK, by the way. But... Uh, Food, so we have processed a lot of food. We got to the race to the finish a few years ago with the plant-based. Everybody got into it. A boatload of venture capital was thrown in. It was the next tidal wave. Well, in Europe, they also got into the same game. They had uh, plant-based uh, salamis and bolognis. And, I mean, and that's not, if you ask any vegan, vegetarian, that's not what they were after. It was us. It was people that wanted to say they're eating vegan and vegetarian, but they want it to look like the regular food they're eating every day. Now, that is pretty heinous, I think. Uh, I mean, what is wrong with us? We wanted to, that, you know, Subway sub, but we didn't want the meat. We wanted the plant-based meat to substitute. So we were kind of lying to ourselves a little bit. But in Europe, and uh, there's been a massive pushback on further processed plant-based items to do cleaner label and to really do more actual vegetable combinations. And I know in New Zealand, uh, New Zealand, uh, there's a company there that's doing these absolutely phenomenal fritters. And these fritters have like beetroot and ginger and all these different items in them. They're like big hush puppies, but the flavoring profiles are phenomenal. So you're seeing more real vegetables being brought to the forefront. Thank you. I'm going to have to let that be the last word. We're a little bit over. There's a bunch of panels starting in 10 minutes. Um, and if anybody wants to see it, I'm going to be just collecting cash for a cage fight later between Neil and Phil. It's going to be in the parking lot right over here. Soon as the sun goes down. Soon as the sun goes down. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, everybody.